I'm Trayana Holiday, and I work with Africatown Community Land Trust. Uh, we, yeah, we are here. We thank you guys for coming. Um, thank you for your patience. We're going to get right into it. I'm going to go right into the intro with Tim Lennon, the Executive Director of Langston. Thank you, Trey, and thank each and every one of y'all for being here today. My name is Tim Lennon again. I am the Executive Director here at Langston, and on behalf of Langston, the Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute, the City of Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, our partners here in the building, I want to welcome you to our home for arts and culture in the Central District, Seattle, Langston Hughes Performing Arts Center. Um, I want to just give a real shout out to the elders and the youth in the room. Can we give, a, give it up for these folks? Um, the, the shoulders on which we stand uh, and, and the seeds that, are, that we are here to nurture and grow. And it so warms my heart to see this intergenerational exchange. We are rebuilding the Central District. We are rebuilding the black community. Um, and it's going to take everybody in this room and everybody y'all know working together to make that happen. On the arts and culture front, there's a renaissance happening in this neighborhood. All right. The Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas. Shout out to Sharon Williamson over here in the front. Wanawari happening over here on 24. Africatown's been holding it down, you know that. Um, we've got buildings now, we've got centers of cultural life and this is right at the heart of that and I'm honored to be a part of that personally and just so grateful for you all to have made all that possible. So without any more on that note, I wanna bring up the esteemed and honorable it's Dawn Mason to lead us into today's programming. Thank you all. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I'm not walking well. Uh, April 14th, I'm getting a new hip. Hey. We thank the divine for modern medicine. Yeah, I don't think we were supposed to live this long. <laughs> Our parts start wearing out. Well, again, um, this community, um, I'm not really surprised, but it um, humbles me that we come together like this every year to um, celebrate ourselves and hear what it is that we're accomplishing. This is not a, um, remember we used to have those meetings, it was open mic and everyone get up and talk for hours complaining about something they weren't gonna do anything about themselves, remember that? <laughs> we don't do that anymore. So um, uh, I'd like to uh, invoke actually what we do. Um, Everyone here knows who Marcus Garvey is, one of the greatest men in uh, America, one who was despised by America. But you notice his name lives on, and that's what we live for. And um, yeah, that's what we live for, that our name can live on in some good way. Well, he said, and I'm going to paraphrase his philosophy, one of his philosophies, he says that, do not go to the strong for justice while you are still weak. But hasten and pray. Come together with people of like minds. We're here together, people of like minds. Accomplish something. Show your good works by which people will voluntarily respect you. And I have to say that when we think of Africa town, Africa Town is coming together with people of like minds, showing its good work, and the respect is coming. The funds are coming, no begging. We don't have to go and beg for justice. Because if we can do that, a lot of people talk about what they're gonna do if they had the money, they're gonna do it if somebody else does it for them. Mm -mm. Just show your good works and people will voluntarily respect you. Uh, We're gonna have Rainier Valley Leadership Academy up here. That's something that we worked on this year. A hard work, but we came together. I call it a collaborated community of clear thinking African Americans. How's that sound? So RVL Academy is a charter school that was uh, colonized. Many of our charter schools are colonized. Whites come in, our children bring in an apportionment uh, and they get money from the state. And we, you know, that's what colonization is, is using, utilizing the resources of others for your good. And the, those running the school didn't even live in our community, so all the money left the community. So um, 
we decided we should do, and we as, when I say we, it was White King and I, I said, so should we do this, White King? He says, yes, and we asked um, Dr. Maxine Mims and Royal Alley Barnes to come to the school to decide if this is something that we wanted to run our own school with dignity and excellence. And we decided yes, and uh, Bayon Coleman will be up here to, with the children in a minute. So this is our school that we will support, and um, the children are brilliant. It's 97% African American, and Somali, mainly Somali is the African children, uh, immigrant children there. And they had not hired any black teachers. How are all white people going to teach 400 black students? And not one person can speak Somali and does not understand that complex culture. It didn't make a bit of sense. And it didn't make any sense for us to allow it. See, they didn't really come. We took, we voluntarily took our children to them. They didn't come and steal them or kidnap them. So now we have a school and we have an excellent leader, and we're bringing what we call, they transitioned out, and the commission approved that, and approved our correction. So we're the correction team. We have a correction team to correct what was wrong with what was going on with the education of our children. I just wanted to give a backdrop to um, the children from, and um, Mrs. Coleman and Ms. Williams from RVL Academy. So, that's about all that I want to say. I want to thank those who are, for those who don't know, my husband passed away last month. And um, it was a beautiful transition. It was, um, he was in hospice. Hospice, I didn't know about hospice. It was very beautiful, very dignified. He was comforted. Um, we um, left no, there was nothing undone in his passing. He had a will. That's what I want to say to everyone. Anyone who does not have a will should have a will. I have no angst. We have a will. And everything was taken care of. There were directives. There were medical directives. Please do that. Do that for your family. Please do that for your family. Much of our property would have not been lost in this community if people had left here with a will. With a will, then the kids aren't fighting and scrapping and arguing over properties. All kind of weird things happen. My family was very smooth. My whole extended family came together, worked together. We had a wonderful celebration of life a couple of weeks ago. And um, so I just want to thank those who thought about us, prayed about us, commented on Facebook. There were 300 or some comments. It was so beautiful and so comforting, so I want to thank you. For, for that, for this community. I can stand up here today because I have a community that stands with us and a community to stand with. I have something to do. It's not, I'm not left with nothing to do. So with that, I'd like to also uh, recognize that Representative Eric Pettigrew can't be here today, but he is, um, he's in Portland today. Uh, he's retiring, so he's leaving the legislature, and that position needs to be filled. No, I'm not running. Uh, <laughs> because I've done my job, been there, done that. My job is to get somebody ready to fill these positions. So um, the next in line is Jukundi Salisbury, and I think he's here today. Give a wave, Jukundi. There he is up there. You go, man. There, there, there'll be other good people running, but we need somebody who... Um, um, likes us. Just being black, any warm bo black body won't do. They have to like us. Germay is here. Wave your hand, Germay. Germay's like Oprah. Stand up and wave, you're a politician. <laughs> I wanna say this, this is what I, I, I think I posted. Germay came to see Deacon Mason when he was ill. He calls me and says, he texts me and says, I'm sitting outside your, I'm parked outside your house, can I come in? I says, yeah, sure. And he came to see the elder. Now, 
We put people in office and they're the best handshakers and grinners and skinners when they want to vote. And then we never see him again. I am so honored by that visit. He was still shaking hands. It's a picture of him shaking Deacon Mason's hand. He was still shaking hands, even though this is a man who can't do anything for him. He was leaving this place, but he wanted to honor him. And for that, I'm ever grateful, and I'm so thankful. And you keep doing that. Don't ever forget. I haven't been in office, everyone, for 20 years, and I'm still smiling at you. I'm still shaking your hand, and I don't even want to vote. Okay? <laughs> Ask the other people, where are you? Even when they're in office, we don't see them. They don't like us. They aren't happy with We have to have someone who likes us enough to come out and put up with us, you know, and be one of us. And so we know that Chikundi has always been with us, Kun Love, all the way. And he has my support. We're going to throw a, a, a machine behind him. Others will come, and they're going to say, someone will come and say they, they used to work for me. Well, they did. That doesn't mean they're going to be, a, you know, represent us. So, um, and since they worked for me and I'm not supporting that person, then you'd have to ask, well, why? Now, so <laughs> that's all I have to say, and I'm not saying any names. And um, so we want someone that we know and who knows us and, uh, and can bring us together with the entire, it's a very diverse district, can bring us together with the district together. And people just love Jakande. And so we know he's going to do well. And he's smart, and he's been to Olympia a lot testifying, participating, um, taking our kids to camp who had never been to camp, organizing parents, he has 100 black parents, and environmentalists, he does all the trails for the park, he's just everything. And he was my intern when he came out of college, he um, volunteered for me, he told people, Dawn won't pay you and she works you real hard, but she takes you real nice places. So, <laughs> and that was so many years ago. With that, I'm gonna sit down I am the convener of this event. It started seven years ago. We came together as a listening opportunity for the mayor, uh, the former mayor. This mayor doesn't come. She doesn't really like being among us. She always has a reason to be someplace else on this Saturday. Last year she came. I think that's the only year she came. So with that said, we have Gurmai who will be given the response to um, White King's uh, State of Africa Town. Now remember, we have a State of Union, State of State, we have a State of Africa Town. This is, uh, White King came up with that idea. I came up with the gathering, he came up with that idea. We work very well together. As you know, he's one of Seattle's uh, top 10 most influential people. Yes. That's what I mean by do not beg for justice. Just do your work and people will voluntarily respect you. They threw him up on the front page of paper next to uh, uh, the richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos. Can you imagine? Isn't that wonderful? And he is not one of the most influential black people. He's one of the most influential people in Seattle. With that, I'm going to sit down. I think I covered everything. And have a good time. Thank you for being here. Um, and with that now, I, I, I just want to make sure that you guys know that drum line that was up here, that was Mashenga. Okay, can we give it one, one more time for Mashenga? All right. And, uh, and from that group, we actually have an amazing person coming up to give libation so we can start the right way. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce Baba Kalfani. Ashe. For these important deliberations, we heard uh, Representative Mason bring uh, uh, Deacon Joe Mason into the room. And for these important deliberations, we want to bring the wisdom of our ancestors. And we do this together. There are no observers to African rituals. So we do this. A. Yes pouring libation to honor our ancestors is a very important ritual. It is a timeless African teaching found in the Book of Ani of Kemet or classical Nubia and Egypt to honor our ancestors by pouring libation. And so we pour for Shaka, Samari, Nzinga, Dahia Al-Kahina, Menelik, Chetewayo, S for Garvey, Mahalcom, Malcolm, Muhammad, for Tubman, 
and for those names you will now call. Let's call our ancestors. Let's call those on whose shoulders we stand. Call them by name. We heard Joe Mason. What ancestors' shoulders do you stand on? Call them by name. 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 Let them join us. Call them by name. Bring their insight to the room. Bring their wisdom to the room. Call them by name. Call them by name. Call them by name. Can we say Ashe? Can we say Ashe? Can we say Ashe? Can we say Ashe? To the proceedings. Amazing. All right, now we have an amazing vocal selection from some RVLA youth scholars. Give them a hand, y'all. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing. has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory. As you guys all know, uh, this is an initiative and a, a jumping start for Africatown. And one of the things that I want to say, uh, since working at Africatown, we've really ramped up our efforts to bring you guys more and more events, more and more programming that allows you guys co to connect with us and connect with the visions of all of the different pillars under the Africatown umbrella. Um, and I will say, if any of you have been to any of our events, have y'all ate good? Y'all eat well? Okay. Well, in order for us to do that, you guys, we actually are going to start needing you guys' support, right? We will take your time and we will take your coins. Uh, so, you, you know, we want you guys to know that this is also an opportunity to engage back with us and help us build and grow so we can be a strong, sustainable organization to continue to fight for our rights and to continue to fight for a fair housing, right, for all of our people so that we can actually have a stake in the place that we made, right? And so uh, please, there, you guys will be seeing it on the screen later, but there will be several opportunities for you guys to text and give. You guys can volunteer your time, and you guys can also volunteer your dollars, okay? So thank you for that. Uh, with that, um, thank you guys. Yeah, we work hard for y'all, you know. So uh, I want to bring up uh, our esteemed leader of the Africatown Initiative, Mr. Y. King Garrett, to go over the Elders of Distinction Award presentation. All right, so it's my honor to, um, this is really uh, Don Mason's you know, baby, and I think it's important um, that we always look back and understand the shoulders that we stand on. And so the uh, Elders of Distinction Award is an institution as a part of the uh, African American, uh, African Diaspora gather Gathering, annual State of Africa Town. And it's my honor this year to acknowledge someone who um, in, I mean, 50 years, over 50 years, um, serving our community, and not just our community, our young people. And so today, um, the 2020, the first Elders of Distinction of Award of this decade, um, seventh annual, uh, we are uh, uh, fortunate to have one of our community giants still with us to receive those roses while he is still here um, and still serving, right? And it's been over uh, 50 years 
uh, since uh, Mr. Uh, Elder uh, <clears throat> Charles Jackson uh, has been coaching, came to Seattle in 1955 from Alabama. My family originates from Alabama as well. Uh, one of 16 siblings, and he, he got here and um, started coaching in 1959 in, uh, in the Rainier Valley, right? And was there for, I think, 31 years. And then we got blessed to get him to the Central District. <laughs> 1990, he came on over to the Central District, Central Area Youth Association, right? And then he would uh, be one of those who led the transition to preserve uh, youth football in our community with founding, uh, helping to found the Central Area uh, Parents and Coaches Associations we know as CD Panthers Football and Cheer. And, you know, as gentrification has happened and displaced our community throughout, a lot of people don't recognize that sports is one of our real assets, islands of community. This is where people come from all over, Federal Way, Burien, Tugwilla, to bring their children to Judkins Park, to CD Panthers, to Rotary, to play sports and still be connected with the roots of this community. And so it's our honor to thank uh, Mr. Jackson and, and honor him and his family. It's not just him, he's brought his whole, his, his family, you know, his generations is passing on and doing this work. And so we like to join me in welcoming uh, Mr. Charles, uh, Jackson to the stage. Let's give a, thank him. 51 years, that's a long time. And so Mr. Jackson, we just wanna say thank you. If you wanna have some words to say, you can come on right up here. I would, say too much okay. I would like to thank everyone for coming here today so that I could get this plaque uh, <laughs> it ain't too much I can say because they said it all. But I was from a family that moment had 16 kids, 13 kids. And I'm number six, so they always called me the mother's boy because we were so close together. And she taught me that if I can help other kids, to help them out. And that's what I've been doing over all these years, and I'm still trying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So we just want to encourage everyone. I know a lot of y'all are 12s and all of that good stuff, but our children can really use our support. So support the youth sports programs in our community. Come out, make it a family out, and then come down and watch a game, even if you don't have someone playing, just to show that support and fellowship with your community. Thank you again, Mr. Jackson. I, that is a cultural tradition for us to recognize our elders, and so we're so excited that we get this opportunity to do so. So thank you again, Mr. Jackson. It means a lot. Uh, so. Now what we're gonna be doing, guys, we're gonna give you guys community presentations. In the sake of time, each presenter will have about three to four minutes to try to give you guys an update. So we'll try to go through this uh, quickly, but also give you guys some great information. First up is gonna be Bayon Coleman from Rainier Valley Leadership Academy. So Ashe. Ashe. Um, this is our lovely assistant principal, Tanisha Williams, who um, is also one of the leaders of our school. Is this working? Okay. Okay, here we go. okay, thank you. So um, as you heard uh, Elder Mason come up and speak about before, um, our school was in a state of colonization. Um, I was not going to RVLA. Uh, Elder Mason came to me and said, this is what you need to do. I kind of looked at her a little side-eyed and was like, mm, <laughs> do I have to? <laughs> um, but then listening to our community and what they were going through, um, there was no choice because sometimes we need to ask ourselves, if not us, then who? Yes. Um, and so that who became us. Yes. Um, so where there has been a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration and a lot of uh, broken trust that has happened in a lack of transparency, um, we are stepping away from that and we are taking our school back. Um, we're taking our community back, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. So um, our three pillars are based off of a collaborative community, decolonization, and activism. Um, 
Previous to coming in, the uh, leadership teams did not look like us. They did not mirror our scholars in the building. Um, our leadership team is 80% global majority. Um, and the individuals who are not of the global majority on our team are anti-racist. Right. Um, so we have began to develop a community where folks who practice racism and want to make it more palatable for white folks and say it's, you know, it's racial bias or, you know, we just have to be culturally responsive, um, it's racism. <laughs> and so those folks who are in our schools that have felt that, they have been the ones to be uncomfortable. And those of us that have continued to be shunned, in, including our scholars, have now have a place where they can come to leadership that looks like them and say, I think this teacher should not be here and be able to explain why, or be able to raise their hand in a classroom and say, I think what you just said might be racist, and know that they're gonna be protected and taken care of. So as we talk about a collaborative community, um, we have space in our school. Um, our school should be a representation of the community, and so we have a lot of community partners here this evening if you need a space to do a quilting class, if you need a space to get together and you know, read or have a book club or whatever the case may be, like, come. Let us know so that we can begin to bring our community in. And that's just not on the weekends. Like, we have created a space within our school where community partners, um, we we're currently partnered with the Willie Austin Foundation, with Urban League, with Jazz Ed, with SPIN, with ACE, um, those, are, those are just some of the community partners that we want to have in the school on a daily basis while school is running. So they can work and they can do what they need to do and then they can step out and continue to build community with our scholars that they'll be working with after school or on weekends or et cetera. Um, we open up that space to our elders as well. And so we know that we have a lot of elders that stop by. We encourage our community to come in and be a part of the school. Um, it's, it's, it's too long. <laughs> it's, it, we need to make sure that we have teachers in the building that mirror our children. Um, and we know that 80% of our teaching population is white. And so, you know, it goes back to Malcolm, Malcolm, Malcolm X, excuse me. How can we give our children to people that we know have never educated in the first place? Right? What, what person gives their child to be educated by a person who has hurt and abused them over and over again? <laughs> Thank you. So it, it is our job to decolonize our curriculum. So our, most of our English curriculum has already been decolonized. Um, it is a work in progress, so it's not going to be something that tomorrow y'all going to be like, ooh, that school over RBLA, they're all done. It is a work in progress, and we are working. And we are working tirelessly to make sure that that decolonization of curriculum happens um, so that our children can see themselves powerful. They can understand who King Musa was. You know, they can understand who all of the ancestors were in our community that have fought. And they can understand also that the education system was never built for them in the first place, but we're about to turn that on its head. Um, one of our last pillars is about activism. And that goes to our babies being able to raise their hand in a classroom and say what they feel and what they think um, without being chastised or shunned for it. We do not need anyone to come and save us. These teachers that come to us and they say, oh, I just, I wanna make it better for our, we don't need them to make it better for us. We have all of the tools and the skills within our community to be able to make the, to be the change that we want to see. And our babies are the ones who are going to save us from ourselves. So it is about teaching them how to critically think about things so that they better understand what do I need to do to go out and begin to change this process? How do I need to stand up and be a leader and to be able to have that, those foundational practices that are going to allow them to have that space to do it? so that these can be the children that are going out to Olympia. And this is not just about charter schools and district schools and all that jazz. This is really about making sure that our children have multiple different opportunities across this state to be able to be educated in the proper way. And how do we link arms with other educators and with other community partners to be able to make this happen? 
because we know who's gonna be left behind. We've seen who's been left behind. So now this is our time to begin to shift that and change it. So RVLA is um, six through eight, or excuse me, six through 12. And right now we um, are rolling up for 11th grade. So we don't have 12th grade yet. Our 11th graders will roll into 12th grade. We have a table um, down below. Uh, Deron Woods and Amy Kelly are there to be able to sign children up if you would like to have your child signed up or just to come in and do a, a, a tour. Come in and see what we're about. Um, if you're a community partner that's like, you know what, this would be great for us, or we have some tools or some offerings, you know, we want to come in, talk to them, let them know. We are located in South Seattle, right on uh, Rainier and Graham. So, and it is so important that we do this work together because we know that land is a piece of power, and that is the reason why we fought for our school. So on January 23rd, we were approved by the Charter Commission to be able to exit out the colonialist view that has harmed our community in very, very major ways and numerous other communities of color across the, uh, the nation. We will no longer allow our children to be capitalized. We will no longer allow for people to come in and say, I'm going to make money off of the backs of our children and our black and brown teachers and say that I did this. So this is a community process. So it's not just us as the leader standing up here. We are only as successful as our community allows us to be. Thank you. All right, our next uh, community um, uh, presentation is coming from Dominique Davis from Community Passageways. Come on, Dominique. Um, I'm just gonna leave it right there. I'm not gonna do a PowerPoint. I'll just leave that picture up right there. The young man down here in the blue, um, RIP, he passed away last year. And so I just want to give props to Matt. He was a, a king all in his own right. That was one of the most brilliant young men I've ever met in my um, existence. Uh, my name is Dominique Davis. I'm the CEO and founder of an organization called Community Passageways. We are a felony diversion nonprofit organization. I seen that there was a need to save our young black and brown bodies out of the criminal justice system. Um, our kids have been criminalized, our community has been criminalized, our adults have been criminalized for a very long time, and we're generations on top of generations in of being victims of the oppressive criminal system. So uh, I felt like I needed to do something about it, so I, I started this nonprofit organization. What we do is work on high-end felony crimes that young people have committed. And what we do is we get these young people and we help them get back in school, get jobs, job training, housing, leadership development, engage in their community, do civic work, get on panels, youth advisory committees. They do all these kind of things, and at the same time, we walk them through curriculums that are culturally relevant to teach them about who they are, where they came from, and give them some self-respect, some self-esteem, and some hope. In the process of doing that, we are also going to every single court date. We're going to their schools, we're going to their jobs, and when we're going to the court dates, we're making sure that we understand, not just they understand, but we understand the situation that they're facing. Some of them are facing long prison sentences. We're, we're sitting up with the defense attorneys, we're coming up with plans on how to fight this and keep them in the community. So what, what we actually do is, we've been very successful over the last three and a half years. We've been able to divert almost 150 years of prison and jail time out of the criminal justice system. We've been able to uh, divert over 100 plus felonies out of the criminal justice system. We've been able to get kids in college, get them jobs, get them cars, get them apartments, get them on the right feet. Most of the kids that get referred to us are all facing gun charges. So 90% of the young people that come our way have some kind of gun offense, which is what I wanted. That's exactly why I started this program, because those are the young people that people were considering throwaways. Those are the young people that are facing the most time, and those are the young people that don't have no support to get an opportunity to change their lives. So this is what we do. We focus on changing the direction and the narrative that they were going down, and we also humanize them in the courtroom by bringing community in to support them. And when I sit up in the courtrooms, I'm sitting next to defense attorneys, because a lot of times I'm not taking a plea bargain. I'm telling this young person and his parents, we're not taking that plea bargain. We're keeping them in the community. You've been doing a great job for these last six months, and you deserve an opportunity to be successful. So we're going to fight for you in court. We take it to trial. I'm, I'm sitting, I don't have, 
we've been winning a lot of cases, so I've had attorneys, defense attorneys, look at me and go, what is your criminal background? How were you able to pull this off? And I tell them I was a criminal. That's what I was. That's my criminal background. I'm an expert at the criminal justice system. So, so what I want you to understand is, and it's so now, it started out just being me about three years ago and a couple of volunteers and a part-time employee. Now we have 16 employees. Everybody that we employ, Everybody that we employ, oh, I'm getting ready to hire five more next week, too. Everybody that we employ, everybody, almost every single person has been to the penitentiary. That's on my staff, except for a handful of people. Mostly everybody's been, I just got a homeboy that just got after 26 years. My little brother Will will testify to that. Um, will Jimerson, that's my little bro, I love him. And Humdi, Mama Humdi's in here somewhere. But anyway, at the end of the day, what we do is we employ the people that normally can't get employed. We employ the people that normally have doors and opportunities shut on them because of their history. We embrace that history, we nurture that history, we train that history, and we take those people and put them in the community to be leaders in the community. That's what changes the narrative. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close on this. I know, where's the timekeeper at? What I got? I got one minute. I'm going to close on this note. We started a program called Deep Dive. I just got funding for it. We're doing a deep dive program. Me and Brother Will is working on this together with a group of other young brothers. And we're bringing all these OGs together, and we're going out and we're grabbing the top 15 to 25 cats that are more than likely to be shot or shoot somebody. There's been a study on that, and we already know from the community that we're engaged in and grew up here our whole life. And so we're going to grab them, and we're going to pay them to put down the guns. We're going to pay them to shut their social media down. We're going to pay them to stop gangbanging. We're going to pay them $1,100 a month to do, go through a daily curriculum to get them housing, to get them, get them job training and jobs, to get them leadership development, to get them everything they need to be successful. I figure, what is money when you're talking about lives? We need to pay them to put, it's their money anyway because that funding wouldn't be available if they weren't in the situation they was in in the first place, right? People have built careers, government has built offices, and government has built jobs off the backs of our oppression. So the, uh, the people that are being oppressed through these systems need to get paid. So we're doing that, and this is where our goal is. Our goal is to set up a plan for them when we bring financial advisors in, real estate moguls in, and we're gonna set plans up for them to be able to buy their first piece of real estate within three to five years. Thank you. Does that make you feel good? Oh, our community is doing amazing things. I was over there almost in tears and I reminded myself that I have to MC. So thank you for all of that amazing work. All right, and this feels into our next presenter, Willard Jimerson with uh, the Credible Messengers. Yes. This is a beautiful space to be in with all you beautiful black faces. And for those who look in the mirror don't look quite as uh, black as you think you are, trust me, it's in, it's in your DNA. Um, so yeah, I'm Will Jimerson. I'm a proud Seattle light from the Central District. I uh, just want to speak a little bit in some of the context of what Brother Dom has already shared. But I'm um, thinking in context of that, I was sitting down with my uncle who's about 70, um, and, and he's probably more like 30 something. He can get in the gym with me and hang out with the best of them. But he had, he had expressed to me that the problem you solve determines the value that you have on others, right? And I have to think about the aspect of when you come from a diseased state of mind or a diseased state of condition, the only way you can truly come up with a cure to that disease is to go inside the disease itself. And then you extract it in terms of the cure and you reinsert the cure back into the disease and that's how you eradicate it, right? And so being um, one that is a pundit, an expert on these particular issues, I, I, I came from the disease state. I used to run these blocks right here on Yesler and Jackson and, and, and hold up the banner of being from Duce, right? I used to represent the streets, but now I represent the people in them, right? And so being one of the youngest to be tried as an adult here in Seattle, right out of the Central District, and since the 23 years at 13, I served 20, 20 and a half years of that term. And I came back at 33. And I realized that I was the cure that need to be reinserted back inside of the community. And so in that effort of doing work around credible messengers, we, we train other folks who have been similarly situated, um, juxtaposed in that way, and we give them the proper training, the proper understanding, so they can go inside the community and be effective in their leadership and be effective in their influence. And so the, the, the notion that I provide is like the early inception of the hospitals, right? In the early inception of the hospitals, there was a high rate of infant mortality. 
and the doctors didn't understand. They was delivering these babies, and then maybe a few hours later, they were dying. And it was like, what is going on? And so what happened was the same doctors that were delivering the babies were the same doctors that was being the morticianaries. They were the ones that was, that was dealing with the cadavers. And, they, and it was just a simple process of them not washing their hands. And so when I'm talking to the OGs or talking to those who came to a particular vessel or particular lifestyle, before they put their hands in the lives of our young folks, we need to make sure that it's sanitized because we don't want you to kill them, right? We don't want you to walk up to them and, and tell them what you used to do and how I used to be about you because it's not about you. Right, and so this is what we this is what we present. This is what we do. Dom gave you guys a good, wonderful over, overview. But one of the biggest things that I'm always going to go out there and hit the mantra in is: don't try to do this in my community if you can't do it in yours. Don't try to do this in my family if you can't do it in yours. Right? That's that's what is about being a credible messenger. Because without that particular understanding, you're not going to be a credible messenger. You're just going to be a credible mess. Right? And there's so many people who are. And so this is the thing that we do. We, 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 we reflect our values, our morals, our dignity, and also those like Coach Jackson, who has given me an opportunity to be on the field as well. You know, but if I had more uh, strong black men like him in my life and like Brother Dom, things would have turned out much differently. So thank you. I want to make sure that you guys get involved. You can hit me. You can hit Dom. You know the work that we're doing, and we're putting the rubber to the, to the ground every single day. I'll shank. Um, okay, so for the next presentation from the community, we have Black Star Line. Let's give it up for Black Star Line. How y'all doing? How you doing? That light is bright. It's so good to be here. I'm grateful to be here representing Black Star Line. My name is Aaron Bryant Thomas. I got another um, counterpart in the building. His name is Saul Kubali. He's coming right here. Come on up, Saul. It's so good to be here. Oh, we got our picture up. Okay. Um, how you doing? Good to see you too. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit about Black Star Line, who we are and what we do. And um, I just want to also say I'm so grateful for the relationship and partnership that we have with Africatown. I could say so much about what Africatown has done and been to me, um, but I'm going to just share about Black Star Line at this time. Uh, Black Star, and I wrote my notes down, so my timer, I'm going to make sure I get it under three minutes. Uh, Black Star Line is a family educational collective created to offer opportunities for transformation, growth to black families through education. We are serving our community by way of a rite of passage program called Embrace Your Best Self. We're here to develop the concept of contemporary adulting for African diaspora and children and youth within the United States and in general, uh, King County in particular. We are creating opportunities for youth to engage intentionally with the process for adulting. So our program is for young people ages 12 to 24. The current state we are experiencing and witnessing is, is too many people who have gotten older and sometimes really old, as in too old to be doing that, and never demonstrating uh, responsible adulting. Our focus is helping them identify one, viable livelihoods without harm to others, utilizing tools to grow your purpose, especially when you face adversity, and three, building and maintaining honest, meaningful, and productive relationships. At the end of the day, parents and loved ones do not want to worry about their children's livelihoods and well-being. This, is included, this includes generational traumas, addressing generational traumas, developing choice-making skills, and dismantling racist systems. So we're on the same journey of, as uh, many of the organizations that spoke before me. Uh, Black Star Line's investment is in developing intentional spaces, black spaces, and processes and opportunities for families of the African diaspora. And so we'll have more information. I want Saul to just share a little bit about what he does with our young people, and we'll have more information for uh, the folks in the room today who are between the ages of 12 and 24. Come holler at us in our bright green shirts so we can get you signed up. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. Um, like Erin uh, explained, my name is Saul Krubali um, with Black Star Line. My responsibility is with um, the young adults, it's about teaching them ethical training, ethical teaching. Who, if you guys know about ethical teaching, it's basically doing the right thing. So we go through history about how human, how we live among us, you know, in, a, in an African village or in a, just I mean, in a good setting. That's the purpose of what we do in Black Starlight. So teaching these young people to be right, to do the right thing, 
So we talk about, I mean, uh, Iwa Pele doing the right thing. We talk about Mamuntu, you know, I am because you are. Those kind of, I mean, ideas, those kind of doctrine. That's what we teach about these young people. I mean, you know, uh, the idea is basically, I mean, like other, you know, um, educated people talked about, you could take me out of Africa, but you cannot take Africa out of me. So we are, you know, trying to take those ideas to these young people, you know, to tell them about who we are. As, I mean, you know, as, as black fo folks, as I mean, Africans from the diaspora, Africans from here, you know, f I mean, in the, in the Middle East, wherever in the world, we are all one. So the idea is just kind of like, I mean, you know, let's represent ourselves out there. We could do it. We're the smartest people. So when we push this to the young people, they will understand, I mean, you know, 100 years from now, at least in Seattle, I am just proud to be in Seattle. Look at all these black folks here. <laughs> You know, usually we don't have this in Seattle. We don't, you know, hardly, thanks for, I mean, um, Africa Town having this kind of program. We need this. You go to the East Coast every Friday, Saturday, you see black folks sitting down just talking about anything. That's what we need here. Thanks to Black Star, I mean, you know, Africa Town to, I mean, you know, creating this kind of, you know, platform for organizations like us to come down here and express and then teach our young people who we should be. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't see our timekeeper give me put up the time, so it, sound, it means I got a little more time. I just want to give a shout out to um, Marjan and Mayate, who are the visionaries of this pr pr this program. Thank you. Moving along here, we have um, another presentation from Historic Central Arts uh, Central Area Arts and Cultural Cultural District. It's HCAACD. <laughs> Uh, thank you for having me, um, having the HCAACD. It took us a long time to get that, but, um, but we have it. Um, but when I moved to Seattle over, um, it'll be 20 years in June, um, I didn't know where to find a black community, or I thought I didn't know where to find a black community. First, I found the club, right? You, you look in the stranger and find anywhere where you could find hip hop and R&B music. Um, at the club, I found, somebody told me where to find my stylist. It was right down here on 23rd, so it brought me straight to the Central District. And um, I found my church, which was on the South End. And, and then I knew, I was like, duh, find a black church. You find everybody you need to know that's black. Um, and then when I started making the transition to from corporate to arts and culture, the first place that gave me a job job was here at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute with the Summer Musical. And so I've been in this field for over 15 years here in Seattle, and I am proud to be the chair of the HCAACD and also the executive director for the Central District Forum for Arts and Ideas, which are both located centrally here at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute. I didn't get a degree in clicking. Ha, there we go. Um, um, but I know that also in the, um, I'm not the only one who has the story of how they started their arts and cultural experiences here at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute. Every time I meet somebody, they was like, they're like, I like, I, I work out at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute. They're like, oh, I grew up there, or my cousin was there, or my child was there. And so that's what we're trying to continue here at Langston Hughes. Um, and so in founding the um, HCAACD pillars, and I've only been running the HCAACD, this will be my second year. Um, we, we work to create and sustain an environment for arts and cultural development, preserving the African and African American legacy in the central area, sustaining and strengthening the physical identity and sense of place for cultural relevancy, and establishing a formalized forum for continued support of artistic creation, economic vibrancy, livability, affordability, desirability, artistic vi viability, and any, any other violity that you can find. Um, <laughs> We are an intergenerational collaborative group of artists and arts and culture. Anyone that has interest in um, arts and culture in the Central District is welcome to come join us at the HCAACD. Um, when we came together, it was the first time that I had, um, when we came together back in 2015, it was the first time that I had personally been at the table with other 
organizations in the Central District that all had the interest around arts and culture. So it's our, for me, my official meeting place with other organizations and individuals. Um, also, and um, we also work to facilitate as much as possible and activate as much as possible. So we're not just sitting around talking about what the next art project is gonna be. We're, we're trying to come together and say, what resources do we have as a body and how do we help support other arts, or, arts, or, arts organizations and the community as a whole with, um, with the work that we are scheduled to do? And we advocate for black artists. We, I believe, when I first moved here and I started first working as an artist, I was what they called a broke black artist, right? That is not the norm. That is not what we're trying to do. We're trying to um, uh, work with the city and other entities around creative economy and building a force to where artists can live and work and be healthy here in Seattle and do our passion because we all know that we are more productive if, we have our, if we're working within our passions. Um, we also collaborate. We've collaborated in the last year with different groups, like the MLK Youth Day celebration that was held here, um, Joe Brazil events, the Super Block. Robert always brings us back to the Super Block. Uh, we we help with the 23rd and Union Midtown Mural Project, um, Black Heritage Society, Genealogy. Um, so we do different things, and so we're able to access this building for different types of event and making partnerships. The HCAACD is not an event body, it is a support body. It is a collective of people that come together to support and uplift arts and culture. Um, and when I say arts, I just also want to say that it's not just individual, it's not just visual art, it's performing arts, it's whatever you feel as though your art form is, or if you're not an artist and you just like to support arts, we welcome you to join us for the HCAACD. Um, we are here, we meet here at Langston Hughes Performing Arts Institute every second Monday from 5.30 to 7. Um, Tana, Tana Yasu keeps up our Facebook page so you can find different things that we have happening or different things that we're supporting or encouraging, encouraging people to partake in on our Facebook page. And you can also email us at any time, but feel free. Our meetings are open and ready. Everyone is a member of the ACAACD. All we need for you to do is come and hang out with us. Thank you, and just because I'm black, I'm gonna say this because I know y'all gonna be talking. I'm leaving right after this, but I'm not leaving because I'm going downstairs because the Central District for Forum for Arts and Ideas has an event after this and I gotta take my butt downstairs and help them set up. So I love y'all. If you have any questions, um, you can see me or see Robert, but I'll be downstairs in, uh, in the Grand Hall. Thank you. All right, coming up we have uh, Haftabu Abdi from uh, the Ethiopian community of Seattle. Thank you. Salam. Abarigani. <laughs> all right, it's, it's very difficult to speak after all these uh, beautiful and strong speakers. But um, <clears throat> to just briefly walk you through our affordable housing uh, project, which is located right on Rainy and Rose Street, and the challenges we face, the success story, and the future. You know, I'll just I'll try to keep it short and brief. So um, the two factors that triggered the mass exodus of Ethiopians in Seattle was the 1977 and 1991 revolutions in Ethiopia, the, the downfall of Emperor Haile Selassie and the Mengistu regime of 1991 were the two factors that led to the mass exodus of Ethiopians here. So when Ethiopians first got here, the Central District, Yeseler Terrace, High Point in West Seattle were their favorite places, and our first community center was located on 12th and Union pretty much downtown Seattle. So we were displaced five times before we ended up where we are right now on Rainier. All because we couldn't afford to stay, you know, in our community buildings because it's too expensive. The city was getting richer and we're getting poorer. So <clears throat> three years ago, myself and a few others came together and said, you know what, we need to stop this. We're sick and tired of moving south and south, you know, all the way, go back to Africa maybe, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, so we said we need to stop this, and we, we purchased the building we have right now on Red and Rose with a diamond pennies we collected from our own community. There is no corporate money in it. We didn't get a penny from the city, from the county, or the state. We bought it ourselves. Yes, yeah. 
So as you all know, Rainier Valley is now changing. So we don't have no guarantee to even stay where we are right now. So we came up with a strategy of actually developing the property we have and convert it into affordable housing with the top floor. Yes, yes. With the, with the top four floors being affordable housing for our seniors and the first floor part of the, the building to, con to continue the services we're providing right now, the community center. So we, with shovel ready, you are all invited for the groundbreaking this November. It's a, uh, yes. It's, it's a 90 units of affordable housing for seniors and we raised $6.5 million ourselves. Yes. But uh, yeah, before I end, I need to say, you know, uh, the difficulties and the challenges we face, you know, through you know, the, the past four years, I've been working with Wai King, my friend. So when I first came up with this idea of converting our property into affordable housing project, nobody took me seriously. All the public elected officials I, t I, I talked to keep on telling me, this is too big for you guys. <laughs> and you guys are not developers. You guys need to find a partners. All discouraging kind of terms, right? So I stick to people like Wai King, you know? So, <laughs> so, yes, yes. So we fought back, we said we can do it. Africa Town has done it. El Centro de la Raza has done it. The Chinatown was a success story. So why not ours? So we push back, yes. And uh, I guess if this project successfully completed in two years, this will be the first East African-owned affordable housing in the, state of, in the United States of America, actually. Yes. Yes. And moving forward, moving forward, we'll be partnering with Africa Town to bring these two communities together. Yes. Because our, our, our challenges are the same, our problems are the same, same people, same ancestry, but for some mysterious reason, you know, I, I, you know in the past you know, years, I haven't seen the, the gap being narrowing down. So projects of this nature, and you know, we, th these generations, are now breaking the barriers to bring the community together and replicate similar efforts so we can continue building assets for our generations to come. So our philosophy is a little bit different from the rest of affordable housing project, just for your record. We're not just building a place for people to sleep. We have Ethiopian philosophy where when, if you help a person, you have to help him entirely, not just a piece or a part of his problems. So what, what I mean by that is when our seniors live in there, we cook for them on the first floor. We have a kitchen. We have the exercise room. The social services will be continued on the first floor. I grew up in a family where if strangers come to our house, in a village I was born and raised, somebody we don't know, our parents used to let us wash their feet, feed them, and let them sleep, and let them go tomorrow morning. You don't just give them a place to sleep, and that's all about it. So our philosophy for affordable housing is different. We let our seniors live there, feed them, and take care of them. Thank you so much. Now that's what we're talking about, right? That is the proliferation of the work that we started right here in the Central District with Africa Town and the Africa Town Initiative. And that is what we're talking about with the ripple effect and taking it into multiplications all across this state and all throughout the region. So thank you for that. That was amazing and inspiring. Uh, our next uh, community presentation is coming from Hamdi Abdul and Bilan Aiden from the African Community Housing Development. I just want to say, after, before Milan talks, I just want to say that it is hard to talk after what we have seen, uh, especially when you have an accent and when you, are, when you are an immigrant or a refugee from another country called Africa that unites us. Assalamu alaikum. So my name is Bilan, I'm the Program Director for African Community Housing and Development. And I'm Hamdi Abdul, I'm the Director for African Housing and Development, Community Housing and Development. 
And I would like to just mention that our mission is to provide opportunities for African community families and individuals in King County to attain health, housing, stability, economic development, and legal and educational services. You will wonder that this is too much, but it's not too much for people who have all the needs that we have seen. Yes, and just like um, the hierarchy of needs, our programs are housing, basic needs, and legal, uh-oh. Okay, housing, basic needs, and legal services. Uh, we provide family engagement opportunities, education, and economic development. And we're located in South King County, um, SeaTac in particular. So in 2019, we've had, uh, we had the opportunity to serve over 4,000 families, and with the partnerships like Africatown, we were able to house 178 families who are experiencing eviction or homeless. And as we mentioned before, we uh, provide family engagement opportunities through community cafes, which uh, some of you have been able to be participants of, uh, workshops and trainings around positive family connections, positive discipline, and parent leadership and advocacy. Here are also some of our educational opportunities that we provide for our youth. Some of them can be as gender specific so that we, our girls have opportunities to engage in sports activities and feel safe and welcomed and have a sense of belonging, but also provide youth leadership opportunities and learn about food justice and how can we grow our own food in a culturally responsive way and be good stewards of this environment that we live in. But we want to engage in and talk to you a little bit more about our economic development program. And I'm going to ask Hamdi a question, which is, why economic development now? Well, thank you, Bilan. That is the question that I always like people to ask me. And then my answer is, after building the basics, after working with the students, with the children, with the families, and still you need to be wonderful, wandering around. We are very curious people. We come to a new country and we cannot be curious. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> and we are allergic to injustice, absolutely allergic. <laughs> so we looked around, we have seen the, 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 the transit, uh, we have seen uh, the technology, we have seen the housing development that is growing, and we have looked at each other and said, and where are we now? That's where the now came. Where are we now? We are way behind. So it is time for us as elders, as leaders, and people to seek and learn about the environment that we are in and find organizations like Africa Town. That's where we thought like we have a journey to walk. And then we talk about leadership because without leadership, birds like geese cannot migrate. You have seen how they take turns when they are flying V-shaped and then fight the resistance of the wind, and then take turns. The one in the first, when it gets tired because the journey is tired, then the next one takes its place. So that is what it means to have a leadership. And then we, we never, never lose one another. We came to United States of America, we came to Seattle, we came to King County. And we are in one of the richest states of the country. We have the best neighbors like Bill and Melinda Gates. <laughs> right? And then how do we then see ourselves and move forward? How do we mimic the Mississippi River which started from one point? And then all the streams joined. The rivers joined, and it became the second longest river in the world. We want to join 
the forces, with Africa Town, with people who I heard what they said, and everything that they said mesmerized me. We want to find each other, and we want to move forward to prosperity. Yes. Thank you so much. Well, it looks like our time is up, but we do have an economic development program, and if you'd like to learn more about our work, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Let's bring up our next community presentation. We have Nicole Bascom, my girl with NARAB. Thank you for having me. My name is Nicole Bascom Green. I was recently married, so my last name is now Bascom Green. Um, thank you for having me. I am the owner and designated broker of Bascom Real Estate Group. I also am still on the board of the directors for the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. And I'm here to talk about housing and home ownership. It seems like it was purposely divine that I come after we have all these wonderful discussions and we hear about housing, real estate, owning things. That's what I'm here to talk to you about because it starts in our communities and each of us being homeowners, that's where it begins. So I'm here to have this discussion with you about housing and home ownership. Most people think it's just owning a house, piece of property, you pay a mortgage, and some people say, what's the difference between renting and owning? The reality is if you're renting, you're paying someone else's mortgage. That's a fact, 100% fact. Either you're paying their mortgage or their house is paid off and you're paying their pockets. Either way, you're paying someone else. And so homeownership is not just about owning that piece of property. It's about building wealth. It, if, I don't know if any of you know, but our homeownership nationwide is 44% for the black community. The white community has a home ownership of 73%. And wealth is built out of that. I don't have a lot of time to give you a history of it, but the white community built their wealth off of home ownership from the New Deal after World War I. We were systematically locked out of that process. So we, from a housing perspective, do not have, did not have home ownership. When we were segregated, we did, but once we were integrated, we kind of lost that. We also lost it in the Central District. I was born and raised Central District. Bulldogs till I die, purple and white. So this is my hood, this is where I grew up. My dad was a community member and a real estate broker for 45 years here in this community, Paul Bascom. And I'm here to hold on to that pillar and that legacy and educate my community around, we have to be homeowners. We have to understand what that means. And homeownership is not just about, you know, owning that piece of property, it's also about Maximizing emotional and physical well-being. Do you know homeowners are physically and emotionally stronger and healthier when you own your home? Increase life satisfaction. People actually live longer when they're homeowners. Their life expectancy is higher. Their satisfaction with their life is better. You improve social utility and attachment to community. Home ownership means you're gonna be there for a while. You're gonna build community. You're gonna support one another. And we had that opportunity in Central District. We weren't gentrified on accident. We were gentrified on purpose because that property is expensive. It's worth a lot. We can do that again. We just have to understand what the, what the capacity is for us as a community. It also provides higher levels of civic participation. This is a civic engagement here. We're participating as a community and it's important that we're all here supporting one another to do that because we can't do it alone. I can't do it by myself, Africa Tail can't do it by itself. None of us can do it by ourselves. We have to do it together. And it increases emotional well-being from the accumulation of financial assets. A home is an asset, it appreciates. If you buy it now in five years, you can take an equity out of it and put your kid through college pay off bills, get out of debt, buy another piece of property. You can't do that with a car. You can't do that with any other asset other than a home. And that's why home ownership is important. So National Association of Real Estate Brokers, which I'm a member of, we are focused on home ownership. That's what we want to bring to the black community, increasing home ownership to increase our community. And we're doing that through a campaign we're running called Two Million in Five Years. We want to make two million black folks, African descent, homeowners in five years. That's a huge push and we are here to do that and support our community in doing that. Because as I said, wealth building is from homeownership, period, point blank. Real estate is the way. And there are many misnomers and misconceptions that I don't have any money, I can't buy a home. 
please hear me. There are down payment assistance that will pay you to buy your house. You need to have money to pay an inspector and put money on your earnest money, but the down payment can come from somewhere else. There's down payment assistance programs out there for you. So please don't let money be the reason. Don't let your credit be the reason. We have credit repair support with NARAB. I have a colleague here, he does credit repair. We have all of that to help you, so I don't wanna hear what you can't do and why you can't do it, because it can be done. Don't let your background do it. I just put someone in, she was uh, addicted to drugs for 30 years. She bought her first house last year, bought a condo. She's a homeowner now, so don't let your background be the reason either. We also have another campaign called House Then Car. So some of us do have capacity, but we buy cars. So then that car note for $500 to $1,000 can preclude you from buying a home because your debt to income ratio is too high. Let's buy the house first and use the house to buy the car. That doesn't mean don't have a car. We all need transportation, but don't buy that Benz, that Lexus, that Infiniti if you're parking it at the apartment complex. Let's not do that. Or parking it in somebody else's garage. Okay, let's not do that. So my name is Nicole. I'm here to help. I'm supporting my community, and let's be how homeowners. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have Devon and Kiana Pickett from The Postman. Hello. <laughs> How's everyone doing? It's still good morning. Um, I'm Kiana Pickett. And I'm Devon Pickett. Uh, we're both co-owners of The Postman. I'm the, I'm the, uh, the, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm the COO, which means I'm the uh, chief operating officer, so I'm um, in charge of the operations. And I'm the CEO, so basically I just um, am the, the vision and all that behind everything. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're a little nervous, but we, uh, we wanted to come be a part of this. We understand like our importance in the community and what we symbolize, and um, it started out as something we wanted to do for ourselves, and then it just grown to be a lot bigger. Um, so. Some people are wondering what uh, the Postman is. So the Postman is something that, a business that we created in love and memory of my great grandfather, Jacques Chappelle, who was a USPS mail carrier for 37 years um, in this area and in Queen Anne. So um, this is this picture. This is actually our logo. My wife did the logo. Um, you can click the next one. Um, so our, our, our motto and our mission is to keep communities connected. That's like our whole philosophy. So. Um, we always tell people we, we know a lot of different communities and different uh, people of walks of life, and we wanted our business to symbolize our life in the different connections that we have. So this is a picture of our grand opening, and as you see, there's a lot of different faces, uh, different types of people um, coming there. So. Uh, so these are some of our services. We just wanted to list that we offer. So we're, we, we're, mailing, we're like a one-stop shop for mailing business services. So. Our mail services, we have uh, four main carriers, so USPS, UPS, FedEx, and DHL, as listed up there. Um, we, have profess we have private mailbox leasing uh, with the professional street address, and then we have business services listed there. Um, so we got just a couple of pictures. Just, this is from our grand opening when we, uh, we, when we you know, cut the ribbon. This is another one I was just in the paper. Uh, <laughs> this was in the, the Seattle Met Magazine and uh, these pictures just really symbolize like the journey kind of, um, it was like a really long journey to be business owners in the Central District. A lot of no's, a lot of doors shut in and uh, continue to uh, keep it going and keep pushing. And so being in like the Seattle Met Magazine was a, a a good testimony and a, a good coverage on the journey, and so we encourage you to check that out. <laughs> so this was a picture, and we, we, we wanted to have a, a more detailed slide, but we got five minutes, and we can't put it all in five minutes, but you guys kind of get the picture, like, we just, we want everybody to feel welcome, but we also, we understand we, who we are, and we're black, and we want to, uh, you know, shine light on our community and let people know, like, we, our philosophy is, like, you know, being heavy, meaning that we're walking the walk that we, you know, that we want others to do as well. So just showing, and then also just being open to like building with the builders and uh, kind of, you know, what happened in the past, we can only build from that and use that as information to, you know, move forward. So uh, just that right there. You wanna say that? 
So this um, clip that's gonna show, we got to be a part of a project of a local artist, um, Paris Alexa, and her uh, music video for her song, Chocolate, which is like a song about embracing black beauty and being black, and um, yeah, if you can play the clip. Okay, well, it didn't play. <laughs> okay, so um, this here is our, our website, so you can find us at uh, www.thepostmanseattle.com. Um, and then that's our address, 1143 Martin Luther King Jr. Way, Seattle, Washington, 98122. Um, yeah, I would, just, I would just recommend coming by, just check it out, see what you, see what you think of it. Um, I would just say we took something that's really mundane and kind of uh, very boring, so to speak, and we put a little color into it and make it more of a fun experience. Um, we are independent, so the pricing is going to be a little different. Um, but uh, just be a part of the growth is what I would say. That's what we want, more and more entrepreneurs from our community, right? Uh, so thank you guys. We have some more entrepreneurs coming up. Uh, Chrissy Brown and Damon Bomar from Communion. Yeah, this is beautiful, man. This is, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Christy. This is Damon, son, co-owner. How y'all doing this today? Yeah. <laughs> It's so funny because we're used to standing up in front of a crowd talking about that brown girl cooks. And uh, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful entry to where we're going on this journey with communion. So you want to uh, give the definition? Yeah. Just to give a little background, you know, I'm not going to assume everybody knows us. <laughs> but uh, we own That Brown Girl Cooks, founded by Chef Christy Brown, uh, about 30 years ago. We do uh, full service catering. We also make hummus out of black eyed peas and uh, sell it in stores. <laughs> oh yeah, so to give everyone a little update, people have been asking, we get emails and stuff like that. We, um, we, we recently suspended the hummus production to work on this project here. Um, we were going through a lot of changes, so we wanted to be able to keep up. So we just kind of pulled it back, keep the integrity of the product, but we will be coming back. Um, the hummus will be coming back with the opening of communion, so we will be serving that, uh, serving that out soon. Um, so yeah, 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 we've been, uh, Working on this project for the last three years, um, it started off with Africa Town, kind of a kind of galvanizing around the Liberty Bank project, um, and then it kind of brought us into this project. Um, yeah, communion uh, to us is is man, I can't even explain it. I can't even explain it. But um, she came up with the name, so actually, I need you to do that. Do that. <laughs> Well, I think it's an interesting thing. Um, one, of the, one of the questions that we've been talking a lot about is how people come up to us and say, man, when you open it, I'm hungry. <laughs> and it's like, okay, that's an interesting thing to tell me when you know that we're not even, there's no refrigerator, there's no stove, right? Like, <laughs> and so that just makes it, makes it more apparent that people are more, more hungry than just for food. Um, and so I think that, that that's that concept that came with the ideal of communion. You know, immediately you think of, most people think of like Jesus sitting at the table and the people coming to the table um, and eating together. But I think in addition to that, it's like we are that representation of love. We are that represent representation of satiation in your spirit because food feeds you in so many different kind of ways. Food brings people together. And so we thought that what, how do we enable all of those things to happen under one roof? And communion was that sentiment, the sharing and, or exchange of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. And so just having, knowing that, that that food brings that conversation to the table. You sit down, you start talking to folks about things you had no, no idea, no plan to talk about, but that food and that conversation and that community brings that to the table. And so we're really excited about this project to be able to feed y'all in the spiritual realm as well as in the physical with the food. Yeah, I don't know how to get there. Smooth. So one of the questions we always get is, what y'all gonna be cooking? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, people, you know, people that knew her back in the day is like, you're not gonna be serving pork, are you? You know, people, people that know us now be like, are y'all gonna be vegan? You know, so it's like, nah, nah, you know, we're doing a little bit of it all. Um, so we call our cuisine uh, Seattle Soul. 
And so it's rooted in traditional soul food, kind of from our lineage and our traditions and things like that, but kind of innovated a poem by the influences that we have here in Seattle. So I grew up on 20th and Main, so right outside of Little Saigon, there's Moonlight Cafe, a Vietnamese restaurant that's right there, so we ate there growing up. And then later in my life, I grew up on 24th and uh, Marion, which is kind of right off of Cherry, where you see a lot of the East African restaurants and things like that. So we draw influences from all over Seattle and kind of, kind of infuse that into you know, black cuisine. So we, uh, my aunt is coming in from out of town, uh, from Houston. She said, well, y'all like Neo Soul. And I was like, yeah, you know, that, 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 that kind of, that kind of makes it right. You know, imagine what, uh, what, uh, Erica Badu eats for dinner. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We're definitely, we're definitely keeping it, keeping it closer traditions, but we definitely want to kind of, you know, heighten it a little bit, kind of give it a fresher, a fresh experience, you know, one heavy on vegetables and, uh, kind of just, like I said, feed in your body, mind, and soul. Yeah, and I and one of the things I think is really important, um, a part of our process that we already do with that brown girl, is to make sure that we patronize other uh, food businesses of color. Um, we because we do the food production, we have a large community of people that we met through the farmers market. Um, then we do the catering, and we, we're always looking for more ways to incorporate community into what we do. So if you make a product, you're consistent. <laughs> that you can provide consistent service for, please hit us up, because this is all a part of our mission, is to make sure that we include and, and just be, be family together. And so we look forward to opening. This will happen in June of this summer. So look forward to seeing you. So we're gonna move through and, and keep you guys engaged. Our next community presenter is Debrina Jackson Gandy with Elevate Movement. Hello everyone, how y'all doing? Y'all gotta give it up more than that. This is a historic day, hello. Well, I am so inspired being here to listen about all these amazing things going on in our community. I'm so glad to be back again, sharing with you about the Elevate Movement. I know I only have five minutes, so I'm actually gonna actually read so I can get it all in. Um, but the Elevate Movement is a divinely inspired movement. I wish I could take credit for it. I cannot. It was an idea dropped to me from above June of 2016. And then January of 2017 is when we kicked off with a large event at the Doubletree Suites in Tequila, the Elevate Movement. So the Elevate Movement is all about elevating the consciousness of African Americans in the greater Seattle area. And we have four pillars. Do I hit this button to move it forward? Is that what we do? Okay. And we have four pillars in the Elevate Movement. There is black money and business, black healthy love relationships, black personal growth and spiritual development, and black health, wellness, and healing. So when we had the kickoff event, January of 2017, the area that people were the most excited about was black money and business at that time. And so what we decided to do was to launch what we call the Direct Impact Dollars Initiative, which is underneath the black money and business pillar. <clears throat> I pulled together a planning team that consists of Devin Stubblefield of Faith Finance, Theo Martin, owner of the, the famed Island Soul Restaurant in Columbia City, and Troy Dawson of Reliant Financial, and Curtis of Africatown, Curtis Calhoun, is a new planning team member that will be joining us this year. So what we knew is that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars that move through our community. And even though my business is for profit, I wanted to come up with a way that we could tap into some of those community dollars directly, not have to go through grants and go to organizations making decisions about whether or not to give you money for causes in our community, but going directly to community members. So we launched in January of 2018 the Direct Impact Dollars Initiative, and it's a model based on direct to community partnering. 
So we figured that we could go to 50 African Americans in the community or those that wanted to support African American businesses and ask for $350 from individuals or from married couples. We wanted these dollars to be pooled so that they could then be turned around to be distributed out to African American owned businesses to support specifically their growth and expansion, not just cover operational costs. And so cycle one was from 2018 to 2019, we achieved our goal. And in the first cycle, we had $20,500 that we received as contributions direct from community members. Woohoo! Yes, indeed. And also, our community partner, Banner Bank, $20,500 less the, the fee that went to our fiscal agent, a black owned nonprofit. We had six business awardees, and you may be familiar with some of them. There is Delbert Richardson of Global Unspoken Truths, Keith Ashby of Presidential Transforma Transportation, Lee Youssef of Angel City Soul Food, uh, Keila Hall of KD Hall Communications, Teresa Hardy of Inspirational Workshops, and Michelle Alderson of Infinitely Well. Give, up, give them a hand. They had to go through a selection process and the review team for selecting the six awardees from our cycle one came from those who actually contributed to the pool. Isn't that a beautiful model? And it's repayable dollars. So all of those business owners are on an automatic repayment plan so that the pool can be replenished. We are now moving into our 2019-2020 cycle where we will have 20, we have collected $28,000 so far, so between the two cycles, direct from community dollars for African American business growth, almost $50,000. And so this cycle, we will award dollars to at least eight African American owned businesses. We would love to get to the $50,000 mark. We're at $48,000 right now. And so today, if you would like to contribute, the link is at the bottom. And I will just close out by sharing our two hashtags, elevate to great, hashtag elevate together. Thank you. So I will go right into our next community presentation. I don't know if you guys have been uh, engaged with us on social media, but we have a huge conglomerate backing us. Let's give it up for Omari Salisbury with Africatown Media Network. Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge Representative Don Mason in the building. Uh, King County Council, our very brand spanking new King County Council member, Gurmai Sahalai, getting it, getting it down. Community elders, mom, you know what I'm saying? Well, welcome everybody. Let's hop right into it. You know what I'm saying? If, if you ain't got it right here, you ain't never gonna get it right there. So let's be clear on that. So if it works, it works. If it don't, it don't. You know what I'm saying? Let's get down to it. My name is Omari Salisbury. I'm just a humble messenger from Africatown Media, representing my colleagues over there. We're based at Black Dot, uh, just right around the corner. So what is Africatown Media? A lot of you guys that are in the building, you're already aware, but let's touch on it real quick. We're a digital media platform with web, blog, social media, streaming, video, and podcast. Now, what's it all about? I said based out of Black Dot with a mandate to cover news and events in the Central District that hold high value and importance to our community and to as well further the overall mission of Africatown through media and communications. And believe me, I'll tell you, be honest, everybody in this room, all organizations have their agenda and their media backing them. And it's good to know we got media backing our agenda. You see what I'm saying? So last year we came here and I told you the importance of black media, that we wanted to come and stand on our, our, on our forefathers and, and our community's shoulders, on oh, Mr. Chris Bennett over there at the Medium and, and, the, uh, and uh, our family over there at the Facts, you know what I'm saying, who, who set, set uh, the pathway for us. And we wanted to use digital medium to, to change the narrative. It's like, man, <clears throat> the mainstream media already has a monopoly on the bad news. That's where they put their investment. We gonna go ahead and put paint where it ain't. There ain't enough paint in telling positive stories about our community. There ain't enough paint in us being able to get a call to action about us and when we need to help us. Let's keep it pushing and tell you what it's all about. 
One of the very biggest stories of last year for Africa Town Media is guess what? Guess what? Let me tell you, is Walter Jones in the building? Where's Walter Jones? Walter Jones came to me, came over there to Africa Town Media the day that Mary got served with, with, uh, um, with an eviction notice. He came over there and said, if we don't do something today, Omari, this woman's gonna be evicted. I said, you know what? This is the whole point of us owning our own platform. We ain't gotta call Jesse. Let's just call the writers. You know what I'm saying? And with, within, within six hours, was able to put something together there on, on video, was able to write an article. You see that 18,290 views for our little itty bitty blog based in the Central District. And what happened? We rallied the community to save a valued black business. And $26,000 and a whole lot of love was raised in one week to save flowers just for you. 600 overall donations. A lot of the people in the room are people who donated to the cause. But guess what happened to our little itty bitty, you know, we're just a baby of a little media company here. We changed the mainstream's narrative. Uh-oh. That's Como 4 News up top. Community saves Central District Legacy Flower Shop from eviction. You guys, the community, we didn't have to run to the white media for them to save us. We saving ourselves. And that's what it's all about. I'm gonna tell you now, our community saved our community. Let's keep that in mind. It's possible, people. This proves it right here. It's possible. It's in us. It's within us. We'll keep it moving. Other good stories of the year. We're supporting the underdog business. Our guy, the deaf chef, right across the street, soulful dishes. Started his business, man. Traction was low. We're like, man, we got to support the underdogs. We got to support people trying to get going in business. And, man, they just need a little crack. They just need a little shade. You see what I'm saying? Now his business is over there thriving. I hope you guys go and visit the deaf chef right across the street. Now. Defending our people and our way of life. If you guys, are, especially y'all that live in the Liberty Bank building, you remember Barbecue Becky calling the police on the residents for playing music there. And guess what we did? What the young people would say is we used our media to clap back. You see what I'm saying? We didn't have to call the Seattle Times and say, oh, well, man, it's this and that. Please defend us. We didn't have to call the cross cut. We didn't have to call anybody. We came back and clapped back ourselves. And the whole community jumped on board. And I dare somebody to call the police on the residents of the LBB again. Watch and see what happens. We're empowering our elders in the fight against gentrification in the Asian place. I don't know if Ruby Holland's in the building today, but for sure, this mama don't take no mess. And she's been continuously pushing the message and the Africatown platform is there for her. Standing with our sisters and giving them a voice when others are silent. You know, Amijah Smith got thrown underneath the bus by the mainstream media the day that she, they were supposed to announce for school board, for the uh, school board director. She was totally thrown under the bus by the media. But you know, we got to use our platforms to stand with our people and especially uplift our black women. Another thing is standing with our elders to defend the Central. When the Central put out a call to the community, they needed to raise $55,000 to be able to stay in this transfer process that the city's playing a game with, but that's another story. But you know, it's like our door is open for, the, for our seniors and our elders. How can we push the message? Our Throwback Thursday. How many people uh, check out the Throwback Thursdays there? You know, my mama a big fan. She always hit me like, what's the throwback? She be wanting to get it early. Throwback Thursday. A lot of people didn't know that 100 years ago where Uncle Ike's is at right now, that was a Sojourner Truth Society. And we used to take care of our own community. Why didn't nobody at DSHS? We took care of ourselves. 100 years later, we can do it again. Right there where Uncle Ike's is at. We took care of our community. Throwback Thursday is all about reminding us of our greatness. Don't believe this cockamamie story that we only been here 30 years. 50 years. We've been in the Central District on this turf for 140 years. And believe me, we ain't going nowhere, and we're using our media to help educate. Speaking of not going nowhere, you guys know Emoja Fest was popping. Again, reinforcing the message to everybody, and I got some Buffalo soldiers there to back us up, that we ain't going nowhere. 
We brought a balance to a discussion, an important discussion in our community. Balance about the discussion about the sale at the local churches. Let's get the discussion out in public. Let's talk about it. And it was good because a lot of times these discussions are one-sided. And so we took an approach of let's talk about both sides of it. We've continued to elevate our black girl magic. You know what I'm saying? You guys just saw Kiana out here. Between you and me, she's the brains of the operation. Don't tell Devon that, though. We've reinforced our most powerful and sacred traditions. This was bubbling brown sugar. We see bubbling brown sugar has returned mighty and true. Our traditions don't have to go nowhere, and we're going to reinforce our traditions and keep talking about them and keep supporting them. We raised awareness around housing and, and housing opportunities. Jackson Heights, 74 community members moving in right up there on 23rd and Jackson and supporting black mental health and wellness in the building. Speaking of that, what's up, Ashley? How you doing? Ashley McGurry, MSW in the building. Good to see you there, supporter. So we've also used this platform to hold our leaders accountable. Mayor Durkin on the Africatown Plaza funding. What's happening? You know, eventually we got some bread, though, 12 million on the project. You know what I'm saying? Hey, but, but believe me, we hammered this message. What's up with Africatown Plaza? What's up with Africatown Plaza? This guy right here, our King County Councilman, hold him accountable. What's your plan for South End gun violence? Come talk to us about it. Uh, uh, the school board, Director Hersey, they just did some partnership with TAP and Washington Middle School. Nah, man, don't just sign that in the middle of the night. It's a good thing, but come and tell us about it. You need to be accountable to our community. What's this all about? And I'll be honest with you, it, it was only a few votes that got her across the finish line, y'all. And a lot of them votes came from our community. She won by less than 2,000 votes. What's your plan for the black community? You see, this platform is holding people accountable, and that's what it's all about. But I digress. The beauty of it all is the teamwork that makes this dream work. And this is our dream team. And, and let, me, let me tell you something real quick. None of these guys, except for Eric on the right, were into TV, podcast, or anything. This is this is convincing. You know what I'm saying? Having to convince people to be like, man, why King? It took like six, seven months, man. And now he got this big time show. But the whole point is telling better stories for us, by us. The AC Podcast with KY King Garrett. <laughs> Community Quarter with our host, Trey Holiday. This one's really special because this one targets people who are re-entering our community from prison or from, from, from substance abuse or people who've been marginalized. And she gives them the toolkit. Hey, brother, this is what you need to do. And a special thank you. I don't know if Eric is here today. I know he was on a shoot earlier. Eric Calligraphy Wilson, this guy came in as a volunteer and has dedicated so many hours, his cameras, his time, his lights, and everything else just to stay committed to this cause. <laughs> All right, so how can you find us? Uh, they broke it up a little bit. Miss Africatown SE, I mean, you guys can find us. You know what I'm saying? We ain't hard to find. Put some effort into it. But you know what I'm saying? We're on every platform. You want to hear the message? You can go to Spotify. You can go to iTunes. You know what I'm saying? You can go to Google Play. You can hear why King's peace world, peace world. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? If you visual, we are we on Instagram, we are on Twitter, we're on Sound Man, we everywhere. You know what I'm saying? Stay up with the message. In conclusion, I'm gonna tell you this: that our mission is clear, it's well defined. We won't be delayed and we won't be denied. That's 100. Yeah. <clears throat> if you like what we doing, last year we ain't asked you for nothing. Because we was like, you know what I'm saying? Where I come from, my mama used to always say, man, we can show you better we can tell you. So you know what I'm saying? We don't take the last 13 months. We ain't asked you for nothing. But we showing you what we can do. This with no support. You see what I'm saying? Outside volunteers. 
Man, give some. Support black media. Support what we're doing. Support pushing this message. You know what I'm saying? If you can donate money, do that. If you can donate time, do that. But give something because we definitely out here trying to give it right back to you. My name is Omari Salisbury on behalf of Africatown Media. Thank you very much. So um, in honor of media, I'm a student of Ida B. Wells. She's the one who has me writing every day. Ida B. Wells wrote every day on the topic of anti-lynching. I write every day. Some of you have got my very long emails. It's important that we communicate every day. If we don't tell our story, no one else will. It takes 10 times for someone to hear something before they get it the first time. Is Chris here from the medium? OK, that's fine. It's OK. So. It's the 50th anniversary of the Seattle Medium newspaper, something that's very important. Just one little thing I want to say. One time, the press who was printing the, me do you know this? The Medium refused to print an, uh, an edition uh, because they didn't like Chris Bennett's editorial, and they refused to print it, and he went out and bought his own printing press. So we own a printing press in this community, and that is important. So we had never again missed uh, 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 um, uh, an edition of the Seattle Medium. So this says 2020, the African American African Gathering presents the Distinguished Business uh, Legacy Award to the Seattle Medium, honoring the 50th anniversary anniversary of media leadership. So to that, now we'll make sure that they get that, and we just want to thank them for continuing to have that printed paper out there. And I really want to congratulate the Africa Town Media for uh, pumping up the technology, because there's different ways. Old people still read newspapers, I'm sorry, honey. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, but we do like that we have our media, and I know a good job they're doing. And um, we thank you for all that you've done. You did a good job with first place this year, also. Thank you. Thank you. We want to hear from KY King Garrett with Africa Town on the actual state of Africa Town. So please welcome KY King Garrett. Peace, world. <laughs> What's going on? That's a hard act to follow. Would y'all agree? <laughs> he turned it up pretty high. But um, I, I mean, welcome, seventh annual. We've been here seven times, right? And, and every time has been about increase and in progress. And, um, you know, I just want to start by saying, you know, can we give a hand for all of the powerful work that's happening in our community, in our region, our diaspora? I mean, that's, that's really what the state of Africatown is all about. You know, I am because we are. Vision, seeing, right? Father sins teach that understanding means to see things as they truly are and not as they are presented to be or appear to be. And to look is not to see. Because I can look at everyone in here, but that doesn't mean I see you. You know, understand means to go a little bit deeper, to go under what stands before our eyes, right? And we must do that. And that also goes with the principle of Sankofa, right? The West African, look back so that you can see what? Your way forward. And so for me, that's personal. I have to look back. If you see here, you see uh, my father, Omari Tahir Garrett, who's in the room, my elder, who's, who's, whose shoulders I stand on, as, 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 many, as well as many others. But directly, I was taught OJT is what he called it on the job training. And so all the children that are in the room, this is a beautiful thing. I see my son, my youngest son, he's running around chasing Curtis around, following him. And this is learning, right? And this is very important that we bring our children, our next generation to the work so they can see it because they're not gonna learn how to build their community in a book in school. So, Man, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very, very, people say full. I mean, just looking at the, all, did you see that all the tools that we need to build our community are right here among us? Every aspect. Man, that's powerful. Um, and so we look back and they say hindsight is what? Hindsight is 2020. 
And that's why it's important that we what? Study our what? Our history, and so we know where we came from. Yeah. Okay. All right. We know where we came from as a part of this journey. They put this uh, story out a few years ago, right? And this is not where we came from. This is a part of the journey. They say, you know, black history did not start with what? Slavery, Slavery interrupted black history. Right. And it's really a blink of an eye if you really understand the totality of our existence on this planet, right? We're talking about 400 year period. It's really a blink of an eye. But it, you know, when you're in the midst of it, it feels like it forever, right? It's like a toothache, like, right? <laughs> um, so we're in 2020, and um, that whole period of the, the whole income inequality that we keep seeing, the wealth inequality, it directly corresponds to the fact that, you know, for 250, 300 years, all the work that we did, all the brilliant ideas that we came up with, all the inventions, the wealth of that, because we're in a capitalist society which says, you know, private ownership and the ability to have intellectual property and pass it on to your next generations, all of our wealth is being what? Passed on to somebody else's future generations. And yet we still create out of thin, thin air, out of just ether, what they call it, Seattle soul. The soul, we create new wealth every day. But right now we still don't have the structures in place to benefit the most from our wealth. And that's one of the things I want to talk about as we go into 2020. So I'm having a little trouble. OK, so that, is that the way it goes? All right. Uh-oh. OK, here we go. All right. So 2020 saw us cut the ribbon on the Liberty Bank building. So as State of Africa tell us about what did we do in the past year? What did we say we were going to do? Did we make progress on it? What are we doing going forward? And what are our challenges amongst us? And what do, you know, what do we have to do? Setting our vision, right? So we saw the ribbon cutting. It was a beautiful, it wasn't just your average ribbon cutting with some you know, developers and a city official and a hard hat, right? It was a black party, because we got to do it what? <laughs> we have to do it our way. <laughs> Right? This is our Emoja Fest, our Black Community Festival, our East Madison Mardi Gras, because we look back and we keep the tradition going, right? And people said this was like a big therapy session, right? We need different types of therapy to deal with the traumas that we've been through. And our greatest medicine is really each other, right? Each other and connecting with the best in each other because they've taught us how to connect with the worst in us and then the worst in the next one that look like us, right? And so that's some of the things that we see going on in our community right now, that disconnection with the best in us. But when we come out, we see, I mean, did we see Cutting Up get busy on the stage? They brought the message. If you listened, they made it beautiful. They moved with it. I mean, this is, this is what it's about. And so we came to Mojo Fest. We have black businesses. We got black community organizations. It's intergenerational. I didn't even see an argument, right? They say, oh, we can't, you can't come together. We didn't have a military force out there. Our security was how we thinking about each other, right? The mindset, right? And so <laughs> I'm only showing these as symbols of one of our cultural traditions, which is the phoenix, which rises from its what? Rises from its ashes. So this is about resurgence. This is why we, it was so important to highlight some of our businesses that are resurging in our community, right? Um, the postman, continuing generation from employee in the postal service to owner in the postal service. That's a powerful story. I don't know if, if people are catching that, right? Communion, and we saw, you know, they say, well, black people, you can't work with your family, right? We just showed you two examples. We showed. A husband and a wife, king and queen. We show a son, I mean a mother and a son, king and queen, right? Doing business, building businesses in our community. These are seeds. We know they're going to keep growing, and there's more, right? And so this resurgence is what we have to focus on. Africatown is an asset-based community development strategy. It starts with our strengths, our riches, our wealth, not with our deficits, because we know we, if you come to my house, and steal all my money. Am I poor? 
Or if I give you a loan, because this whole society runs off of debt, right? It runs off, that's what finance is, the science of debt. So if I give you a loan, that's an asset on my balance sheet, right? Okay, so we just consider that we gave the enterprise of the United States of America and all those European, we basically gave them a loan, right? So our asset sheet is pretty, is pretty nice, because <laughs> all this wealth in the West is based in our work, right? We just got to figure out, you know, them collection services. We got to get some robo, we got to get some robo collars to get our, give us our stuff back, right? We got to collect. We got to collect on some debts. So the resurgence is what we want to highlight. 2020, we come in and we start in the 20s and we're starting on an up trajectory, right? And as we start adding on and I step over here so this person can get on my shoulders and you, we all come together and this one's getting on that shoulders, we're going to keep what? Elevating, right? <clears throat> so yeah, Liberty Bank was nice. And really what it was was an example, right? And, our partners, Black Community Impact Alliance, Burr Bar Place, Capitol Hill Housing, Affordable Housing Developer. That was just to, uh, to show us that we can. Because a lot of times, they make us think that we can. So we had to show another way is possible. We had to make rhetoric into reality, you know, and, and, and some bricks and mortar. But we know that buildings don't build community. People build community. People build community. And, you know, we're not done. Liberty Bank is great, but one building doesn't make a community. We need, you know, 20 Liberty Bank buildings, and we need, our, as, 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 as Sister Nicole said, we need to own these homes again because we started out, we were high home ownership rate in the Central District. We don't all just want to be, you know, in renting, but we had to stabilize some things. But this is in the commercial space where Communion is going to have their restaurant, which continues the tradition of, Miss Helens, Thompson's a point of view on 23rd and Union. I mean, look at the name, Communion. You got community, you got union, it's on union. See, they didn't get into all of that, right? They didn't get into all of that, but it's always levels to this, right? And that's our culture, that's our art, that's who we are, it's levels, right? And so this is the community coming together to plan our next project in that space that was not built out yet because we know we have what? Work to do. See, we got to understand we've already done this. Coming out of shadow slavery 250 years, not only were we robbed of our physical capital, we was robbed of our social capital, our names, our language, our culture, our holidays, our heroes, our uh, gods, our, you know, deities. We were robbed of all of that. And we still came out landless, penniless, and built cities, jurisdictions all over the country. So we built them so quickly from the 1860s to the what, 1880s? Then they make the Ku Klux Klan and then they want to come and bomb Black Wall Street and all of these times. So let's not think that we can't do it. We just have to orientate our mind to do it, right? And so that's what this process is about, getting those muscles going again. Just like we, you see that unity with the dance team? We need that same unity in business and community planning and getting our health system together, get all our different systems. Just like the body is made up of what? Systems. So we have to now rebuild the system so that we can function healthy as a body of people, community. So yeah, that's, you know, we got right into building and it's not, and, and it's our young people. We include them, right? This is them using a game they love to play called Minecraft, if you have children or grandchildren, right? We put the Central District in the game so that they could imagine Africa Town doing something they like to do. They're learning the technology. We did this in partnership with the University of Washington School of Architecture, so this is on the campus. So they're learning about careers in architecture and urban planning at the same, all in one time, right? So that they now have a sense of ownership and that they can design and make the world. We don't just have to react to what other people do. We don't have to just try to get in where we fit in and what someone else designed. We have to design the spaces, the places, the communities that bring the best out of us, allow us to grow and thrive as human beings, right? So that's what we want to introduce our young people to, and we're doing that. <laughs> this is them. So not only did they build it in the game, they also drew plans, and they also built physical models. 
and then they presented them to the community, right? So we have to, you know, always be given to our future. And what came out of that community planning is the designs for our next project, which is Africa Town Plaza, right? And so, <laughs> at the end of the year, um, we're, we're, we were awarded by the city of Seattle, Office of Housing, um, $12 million to move this project forward and $2 million from the King County, right? The, it's about $46 million project. And then there's a million dollars in from the uh, Equitable Development Initiative to help with the commercial space. Because those housing dollars don't finance the commercial space. And so if you take out a loan to build out the commercial space, you got to pay the note, so then that has to get paid on, passed on to the tenants, and then it's not affordable for our businesses to stay in the community. So we have to raise that money independently, and a million of that dollars that people heard about the, next, the last year um, is going into making that space affordable for our community businesses, and also having community space so that we can gather and have functions and planning, and we got the technology and the whiteboards and all the things to bring out our brilliance. Okay. and so. We thank the community. Please give yourselves a round of applause for all that, because when we put out the call through Africatown Media that we needed people to send a message down to the city to stay on track, y'all responded to the call, right? And that's all it may take sometime, an email, a phone call, a letter, or show up at a meeting. My time is coming to an end. <clears throat> and I have a lot more to say but I'm gonna say it fast. <laughs> so is, is, is uh, Emily Alvarado here? Okay, all right, well, anyways, we are, you know, we appreciate the mayor's office and the Office of Housing staying on track. A lot of people put work into making that project, you know, possible. Um, but with all of that said, this is what we're facing in Seattle. This is the reality. Now, there's, you, do you see the separation, the apartness? What do they call that in South Africa? All right. So it's very important that we struggle, not just for, you know, this is half. This allows you to live in Liberty Bank. That top number allows you to buy a house in the CD, maybe. <laughs> Maybe, right? And we, we, we can't have people stuck in Liberty Bank building for the, you know, that's not, they're not gonna build that much wealth, right? So that's a entry point, but we have to get to the home ownership. That's why we're glad to partner with NARAB around um, increasing access for our community. Now, it's important because this is Seattle 2035. I think every five years, which is, an, this is another year, they go into the comprehensive plan and make adjustments and things of that nature. Uh, Mr. Stevens, is, is this the year for that? Okay, we have to struggle because you know that Space Needle, when they put the Space Needle up for the World's Fair in 1962, it was to say that Seattle was a city of the what? Future, right? The Jetsons and all of that. Right now they're saying Seattle, city of the future again, right? So right now, this is the model of the city. So are we gonna allow this to be exported to all other cities as a successful model? What does that mean for our people wherever they are? And people are coming to this city. I was in a meeting, Triana was there also, and they had some research coming and said, we're here in Seattle because you have a great model of housing desegregation. <laughs> right? And I won't go into the deep, but we said, oh no, you have to, you, you know, I don't, you, the numbers don't always tell the real story. My point is, it's important that, you know, when we weren't in that Seattle 2035 plan, we had to write ourselves in. That's what the Liberty Bank building project and the other projects and all of the work that we're doing with Africa is about writing ourselves into the history. Because the Seattle 2035 plan they had didn't include us. So we had to do a Nancy Pelosi. Huh? <laughs> we had to do a Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> we gotta rip that one up and come with a new one. So <laughs> we need you to stay hands-on and involved and engaged in this. It's not gonna happen on its own. One of the projects that's been dragging on is the, is the, 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 the fire station six on Yesler. We wanna, we need to get that going as our innovation hub, 
right? So that we can be solving these problems and having these presentations every day of the week. Right now, they're parking meter-made vehicles there. No value being brought to our community by that. None of the plans that they've made is that consistent with that use. So <clears throat> Africatown is moving forward. <clears throat> the most important part is that we move our minds forward. If we move our minds forward, eventually we'll see our reality catch up with our minds. So we got to get our minds right. Is that right? If, if you think that we need to get our collective and individual minds right as a key to our future, let me see your hands in there. OK, we have some issues. But we also have solutions, and they're among us. And one of the things that we're focused on building as we go into this year, we've been working with IAC, Institute for African Centered Thought, um, Dr. Arisha Day, um, around making sure that the, 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 the practitioners have an African-centered lens. And this is so we've been gathering to bring them together. But one of the issues that we're finding out is uh, the resources are not necessarily there. We know we need to connect with someone who can help us, but the money's not necessarily always there. But what we're doing is getting our connected. We had the first one January 4th. That was the first event of the year health and wellness, because when we get in these buildings, we don't want to be stressed. How many people experience anxiety and stress on a regular basis? All of us? So we need tools, right? <laughs> OK, so when we get in the buildings, if we're all stressed out, and put everybody that's stressed out together, what's going to happen? Right? So um, that's very important that we move that forward. And we know that we're having a crisis right now in our community. This is why it was very important that we have Brother Dom here, we have Brother Will here, because they're on the ground, hands on, with what we see going on. When we see these gunshots, some of us, we know that these gunshots are really just frozen teardrops, you know? That's just that pain being recycled in our community. So we need them on the front lines, and we need to support that work, and we need to get all the healing modalities that we need around there holistically so that we can really turn and redirect that energy in our um, community. We know they tried militarization in the 80s. They tried weed and seed. And at the end of all of this, you got seven people being shot downtown. And how many millions of dollars have they spent? So we know that guns, police, is not going to stop the mentality, right? So. This is where we are. Imagine, design, and build, right? We have all the theories. They've, they've done the work. Marcus Garvey, right? They, they've done it the, all through the 60s. They had all the ideas. Now we have to make it real and brick and mortar in our physical um, environment. And so we have to get our institutions under our control. One of the things that's happening right now is they're kind of trying to, now that we got some momentum, you're going to see a lot of different things pop up that sound like, that look like, right? And some of the people, they've been saying this for the last 50 years. And we're trying to now just pull together the shambles, but now they want to take us back to the failed leadership models. We can't go back to those models. The Boulé model is not a model that works for the masses of black people. That elitist model, and that doesn't work for us anymore. I really, I don't think it ever worked, right? So you're going to see some struggle, because there's never, what did Frederick Douglass say? Without struggle, there's no progress. And he did say a lot. <laughs> he did say a lot. He also said, you might not get everything that you pay for or work for, but we're definitely going to have to work and pay for everything that we what? We get, OK? And so with that, I say thank you. We're going to have our response from our newly elected council member, Gamai Zahila, because we got to take it from the streets to the city, to the county, to the state, to the federal, 
and to the international African diaspora black community, and we got to get well and get strong and get back to who we are and get back to our greatness. Thank you all. A few months ago, I came to an Africa Town event, and I got a history lesson. They talked about Kujo Lewis and the Africa Town out in Alabama, the first Africa Town. And that was a story of the last shipment of enslaved people that we know of uh, from West Africa to Alabama. And that community, like Y. King said, rose from the ashes and formed their own community called Africa Town, just north of Mobile, Alabama. And the fact that Y. King and Africa Town was able to bring a speaker a few months ago and talk about that and make sure that we're connected to that history is one of the most beautiful things in the world. And I just wanna give them a shout out for that. One thing that I heard Y. King say is that buildings don't make community. The people who live in it make community. And the fact that this organization is able to bring together so many different people doing so many different things and seamlessly weave it into community is one of the most inspiring things I've ever seen. And sitting here it was the most beautiful display of black excellence I've ever seen in my life. And you got to give them a shout out. Thank you so much to everybody who's come out here. Thank you to everybody who's doing the work to advance our communities. And it is just a huge honor to represent all of you. Thank you so much. Another thing I heard Y King say is that things are not always what they seem. And after one month in this job, I got to tell you, things are not what they seem. The word equity is the most abused word in the English language. I'm seeing it over and over again. People will use the word equity to advance whatever their agenda is, starting with their conclusion and then working backwards. And it's really a tragedy, and we have to be aware of that, and we have to call it out. I've seen people use equity to advocate for why we need more bus service in Bellevue because, because Bellevue has a higher density or a higher population and so equity means bring in services where the highest needs are, there's a high need in crowded areas, therefore equity is advanced when we bring transportation to Bellevue. L really, this is what they're saying. Equity is bringing bus service to areas that are historically and currently under-resourced, areas that are products of displacement, where our communities are being pushed out into South King County. That's where we need more bus service. That's equity. I've been a part of meetings where they're talking about big development projects, where they're saying, okay, we're, we have the plans for this development. Now let's bring in black artists to hang up murals, as if that's equity. That's not equity. Equity is understanding that development should be a driver for economic prosperity. It's recognizing that black developers exist, black contractors exist. You can use development as a way of bringing wealth into our communities, but they're not using equity like that. I've been in meetings where they talk about equity and they say that, you know, the new youth jail is gonna be filled with resources as if that's equity. No, equity, is saying that before we build this new youth jail, let's take $245 million and invest it in the Dominique Davises of the world, in the Will Jimmersons of the world. Where would our criminal justice system be if they had that kind of prosperity, if they had that kind of wealth lining their pockets and bringing up our communities and saving our children from the system? That's equity. And so I heard Many things from our brother Y. King, who is always doing the work, Africa Town, who is always bringing our communities together and acting as that river, as Mama Hamdi said, being a river that integrates all of our streams so that we're all headed in the same direction. That's what Africa Town has to be. That's what it's going to be. And I want to be part of that. I want to be the person that you lean on. I will be the voice at the table, making sure that equity is centered, that our communities are centered, and making sure that everyone is being held accountable. I want to make sure that our office opens up resources, opens up information, and gives you an avenue to advocate for yourselves. So this year in King County is a biannual budget year. That means our priorities will be set this year for the next two years. 
and we need to be at the table. I sat with the director of King County's budget department two days ago, and I said, how can we get our communities at the table so that it's not an after the fact thing where the priorities are set and then we're coming saying we need something, right? And he told me the priorities of the budget are set in three different places, at the King County department level, at the King County executive level, and then at the end at the King County council level. And he said most of the time, people are coming at the King County, King County Council level to advocate for their projects and for their communities. But once it's to us, King County Council just approves or rejects budgets that come from the executive and come from the departments. And at that point, the priorities are already set. So it's too late at that point. So our office is now working on budget 101 workshops where we have those departments and the executives come along with the budget director and show communities these are the places where you can advocate for yourselves. We're setting the priorities right now. What do you need? What we, can we do for you? And we will be holding these workshops. We're going to make sure there is language access. We're gonna make sure that the materials are gonna be there. We're gonna make sure that everybody has the tools they need to advocate for themselves because knowledge is power and that's the only way we're gonna prosper when we know how the budget is set and we're advancing those priorities. I can talk about many other things that we're doing, but Trey Holiday told me to keep it at five minutes. I just wanna say thank you so much to every single one of you. You inspire me every day, you inspire our office. I wanna give a big shout out to my chief of staff, Rhonda Lewis, who's up there. Please make sure that you meet her and introduce yourself to her as well. Wave at him, Rhonda. <laughs> Thank you again, we, we will be your resource, we will be your avenue toward the King County government, and even when we don't have jurisdiction over a certain thing, we will be advocates, and I, and I promise you that. Thank you so much for your time, we really appreciate you.